Howdy folks, welcome to Found Flicks. On this Explained video, we're looking at the latest entry in the long-running Ju-On or Grudge franchise, the new Netflix series Ju-On Origins that delves into how the infamous curse was created, mainly following a woman that after hearing some strange sounds at her home, calls upon a psychic researcher to investigate the problem. First of all, this series turned out way better than I could have ever imagined. I mean, the Ju-On franchise feels pretty played out at this point, with nine previous Japanese films and the American reboot remake, the fourth one, was pretty uninspired as well. Yet yeah, not exactly terrible either. It just didn't feel like there was anything new to add to the story at this point. Impressively, this new series, made up of six 30-minute episodes, manages to breathe new life into the franchise and does a lot of new things while also utilizing the kind of overall major aspects that we associate with the series. It's also way more hardcore and brutal than any of the movies, with some seriously shocking and violent moments. It just feels like it has a lot more edge to it than ever before. Before. And as far as how it connects to any of the previous movies, it really doesn't in any substantial way, as this goes into the origins of the curse and changes a lot of the expected beats, which is also a good thing in my opinion, but you know, sorry, no more Kayako. But it does follow some of the hallmark staples of the series, which is synonymous with the Juon franchise. One, if you enter the cursed house, you are now marked for death, and the spirits inevitably get pretty much everyone. Or two, if you move into the house, the tenants relive the original violent incident that created the curse. And three, the story and timelines are going to be jumping around all over the place, making it very complicated and convoluted. That's kind of how it always goes. Origins follows these basic pre-established rules, although there is a lot more to look at over the course of the episodes, and quite a few strange mysterious events that do bear explanation. So we'll be doing a deep dive into the origin series, trying to explain the entire thing, as well as all of those many potentially lingering questions about the story and how things go down, as well as explaining the ending and how the story could continue into a potential season two. The opening informs us that the Juon films were in fact inspired by true events, and just like the movies, all came from one cursed house, but warns the real events are much more terrifying than the films. This is why our story is only loosely connected to the many previous film entries. This is supposedly the real story that they were based on. As we begin in Tokyo in 1988 and are introduced to several new characters whose lives will become intertwined by the house and then finally learn the true origin of the evil residing there. A young actress, Hakura, appears on a TV panel show and reveals supernatural activity that she heard in her apartment, that of small footsteps sounding like running at night. She came in contact with paranormal author Yasuo, asking her to record the sounds, and he gets a tape that very clearly contains the footsteps as she described, and when discussing it later, says she was fast asleep at the time so the sounds could not have been coming from her. Also heard on the recording is a scratchy voice that they can't make out, which is played again on the show. They still can't decipher the message, but the female co-host notes that it sounds like it's coming from right in front of the microphone, which is pretty unsettling. Another panelist considers that it isn't the room that's cursed and that perhaps it was either a visitor or present she received being responsible for the strange activity. After the show, Yasuo hopes to chat further with her about her story as he has collected it into a new book. Curious why he's collecting these stories, Yasuo admits that he doesn't know why, something that becomes quite important in the grander story. She reveals that her boyfriend Tetsuya came to visit and had some kind of experience that he refuses to discuss, but was adamant that she leave her apartment immediately to stay with him, concluding that since then he's been acting strangely. He then chooses to track down her boyfriend and interviews him about his experience. He begins that there was a strange house that he visited, well yeah that's usually how it starts, and he wanted to find find a house for him and Haruka to live in, but felt something was off as soon as stepping in. Yasuo immediately interested in knowing where the house is, but when saying that he would go visit it, Tetsuya refuses to say more and reveals something that he hasn't to his girlfriend. Since visiting the house, he's been seeing things, so you shouldn't go. Touring the house, there's still furniture left behind covered in sheets. At the window, he hears rushed footsteps somewhere in the house, and when he turns to look, a woman in white is standing behind him. Our new take on Kayako from the original films. Elsewhere in Tokyo, we briefly meet a man and young girl, which I initially thought was his daughter, listening to a recording of Yasuo and his tape deck. The young girl grows frightened and removes the tape, which infuriates the man who proceeds to beat the heck out of her. And now I'm like, oh yeah, he probably kidnapped her, but it is a while before we get the context of what this scene was all about. We then move on to the beginning of the tragic tale of young transfer student Kiyomi, and first real victim of the house, seen meeting with the principal and her mom, who 
seems to hint at something being off in their relationship to the principal, crying to him that this is all her fault, and even though she raised her as a single mother, has caused her daughter so much trouble, which is kind of a lot to lay out on this poor guy, and it actually seems that she is faking her predicament here entirely to gain sympathy. After class, Kiyomi is stopped by two other girls complimenting her outfit, and asking if she likes cats. Sure, who doesn't? She says she does, but that there's recently died. And they mentioned a house nearby called Cat Mansion, even though no one lives there, many cats gather around. Wow, Cat Mansion sounds like a super fun place, let's check it out. And the girls invite her to go with them to look the next day. For now, returning home and finding her mom busy cooking. On the news, we overhear reports of a missing six-year-old last seen with a man, considering it's related to another missing person from months earlier. This certainly sounding like it was our guy we saw in that car earlier. There's actually several of these various news stories throughout the season in the background that all seem to imply other deaths and terrible accidents that somehow stem back to the cursed house. This one being the first that we hear about. Keep an ear out when you're watching later. Mom weirdly asks if the teacher earlier gave her a look, thinking he intended to make a pass at her. And it sounds like she slept with her daughter's previous teacher to avoid this potentially happening, saying she used her own body to protect her. She tries to touch her hair and Kiyomi slaps her away, annoying her mom, saying how much she owes her as she seduced her own father, calling her a slut. Well, that's a pretty alarming thing to accuse someone of, but again, it's more like her mom has this whole weird perspective on things that isn't exactly accurate. We'll figure that out later. Haruka returns to her boyfriend's and weirdly finds him asleep, huddled in the corner with a blanket. She asks if something happened, but he fibs that he just dozed off and asks if she wants to meet his mother, implying that he wants to marry her, but has something else to tell her, interrupted by footsteps in the other room. And he finally gets real with her, thinking this is his fault, as he went to a house that he shouldn't have gone to, and that it wasn't her apartment that was the problem. Suddenly spooked, he notices the door that was closed is now slightly open, then hearing more footsteps and a light turns on in the other room, both grabbing each other in terror. He rips the door open, finding nothing out of the ordinary, but then seeing the woman on the other side of the door. Blue tinged feet step out, hearing noises and croaking. Her seen holding a bundle of something in a blanket, a baby I would assume. He screams bloody murder, but it's just Haruka standing there who tries to calm him down the best that she can. To be honest, I'd be freaking too. Can't really blame him for that. The next day back at school, the girls again talk about cats, joined by some slick haired dude with a pompadour. The girl saying that he's coming along as their bodyguard. Kiyomi is hesitant, and the other girls offer to send him away, but she relents to have him tag along to the house, finding the gate open, but the door won't budge. Kiyomi finds a black cat there, which are actually symbols of good luck in Japan, and picks him up giving him scratchings. They manage to get in through the side, still taking off their shoes. Gotta be respectful even in evil cursed houses. But shockingly, the girls didn't bring her to look at all the cats, yelling surprise and knocking her to the ground. And Yudai straddles her, threatening her to not move or he'll stab her, and proceeds to sexually assault the poor girl. The other is giggling and even snapping Polaroids, which is pretty demented. One girl, Mal, is already staring off in a daze, as in most likely possessed. He also mentions seeing some blood, meaning she's a virgin, which negates all of her mom's weird stories about seducing her dad and being a slut and everything. She's the crazy one. They leave her all alone, and hearing the cat upstairs, she follows the noise to a closet in a bedroom and closes the door behind her. Hearing the floorboards creaking above, she's greeted by the woman in white up there and yowls upon seeing her. Yudai runs up after her, opening the door and getting startled by the cat running out. He asks if she's all right. Uh, no, you jackass, saying nothing, but goes at him wanting security anyway. And Mal walks off while the other girl, Yoshi, comes upstairs and finds Yudai with Kiyomi all over him. That is a weird change from two minutes ago, I'll say. They decide to leave, even though she's worried about the missing Mal, but too late for her. Outside, Kiyomi is still attached to Yudai, asking him to walk her home. And when walking away, Kiyomi flashes a big old smile to her, which indicates that she too now is possessed and is dragging Yudai down a dark path with her. Back with Haruka and her boyfriend, they appear on the way to meet his mother, joking about her being nervous and calling it a fun audition. Getting no answer at the door, he goes in first and asks her to wait outside. She hears her name being called, seeing Tetsuya somehow standing across the way, then appearing at the door introducing her to their cat. She looks over, seeing the woman in white, and wakes up at work. This may seem to just be a dream, but we come to learn was actually Tetsuya's mother psychically calling out to her, and soon understand why that is, as she gets a call informing her that her boyfriend has died. Also on the news, hearing about three boys that abused a girl for months and killed her and stuffed her in a barrel and filled it with concrete. Most likely another scenario sparked by them entering the house. 
that always leads to more violence. At the funeral, Yasuo is there to offer condolences, and they only know that he suddenly collapsed in his room. He remembers how he felt it was all his fault, and how he was looking for a house for the two of them. He had good intentions, at least. The uncle comes in, requesting her to come meet his mother. She says that they couldn't even show his face to everyone, but wants her to see. And when opening the little doors on the coffin, see his face frozen in an over-exaggerated look of absolute terror. At school, the principal questions the girl about their now missing friend, but strangely says he hasn't called the police because she was spotted recently at a nightclub called the Rabbit Hole. Kiyomi comes in, saying her mom has something she wants to discuss with the teacher, wanting to see her tonight, and leaves the girls alone. Kiyomi demands that she hands over those photos and asks for help to find Mal, but Kiyomi rebuffs her, saying that she has plans with Yodai and casually leaves. So Yoshi ventures to the club alone, where it seems they have been many times as several people recognize her, but none have seen her missing friend recently. She then hears a ghostly voice calling for her, seeing a girl standing far away at the other end of the club. And it is Mal! Yoshi apologized to her, and she only holds out her hand, escorting her somewhere else in the club. But this is the last that we see of either of them, Mal certainly luring her to her death. Kiyomi returns home with Yodai in tow, hearing her mom having sex with the principal in the other room. The two sneak past to her room, and moments later he comes out worried about being caught, hurriedly gathering his things. Kiyomi clearly has a plan to tend with her troublesome mother, reading Yodai a letter that she's leaving and to not try to find her, then taking it to her mom and reading it to her. She tells her to leave with no remorse, saying it would be a relief hearing a loud languishing meow outside, causing her to ask if she's the one that killed the beloved family cat. Growing incensed, she orders Yodai to kill her. When he hesitates, she questions if he's all talk, and uses the photos as blackmail to incentivize him. If he doesn't kill her mom, she'll release the photos to the police. With no other choice and the violence taking over him as well, he grabs a phone and bashes her in the face, calling her a murderer, as a few more whacks finally silences her mom. She calmly tells him to wash his hands and leaves the note, along with digging through the trash to sprinkle some semen on her to make it look like the teacher was responsible. Dang, that's pretty cold, lady. But of course, we know that she's also under the house's influence at this point. The two now bound together by their sordid history, they walk off together into the night, hearing on the news that the teacher was indeed blamed for the mother's murder. Meanwhile, Tetsuya pays his mother a visit, appearing and opens his mouth, but only a croak comes out. Her asking if he's trying to say something, but walks off before before learning anything more, but now we know that he's just ghosts and everything. We now jump forward several years to 1994 and catch up first with our twisted couple. Yodai now works as a garbage man and apparently isn't so great at it. His boss getting pissed for his lack of ability and slow speed, and this violence permeates its way back home, where they now have a young son, Toshiki. Yodai is upset that the brat, as he calls him, won't listen to him, accusing him of being that teacher's kid. She jokes that he sounds like her mother, which sets him off and starts choking her in the other room seeing Toshiki is joined by the woman in white, and his dad gives him a taste too. She looks up, seeing the woman there, flashing back to that moment they first met back at the house. Well, things have only since then further spiraled into darkness and violence for them, and it's no surprise that Child Protective Services is getting involved, Miss Ariyasu showing up at their apartment. Getting no answer, she tries the knob and it's unlocked. The place is a dump, and there's no sign of the parents, but poor Toshiki is there all alone, just staring in silence. Seeing his arms covered in bruises, she makes a call and gets him taken to the hospital. The doc saying that he's underdeveloped for his age and could have died of malnutrition if not for her intervening. Ariasu wanting to put him in protection away from his parents. But that unfortunately doesn't happen. A frustrated Kiyomi coming to the hospital to collect her son, unwilling to even listen to her pleas about protecting the boy. And is more alarmed seeing she is covered in bruises as well, offering to help anytime she needs it. But she's not interested, overhearing more news reports of odd incidents, like a gas plant poisoning resulting in seven fatalities. Again, all seeming to be related to the curse that is now spreading throughout the entire country. Jumping forward another year to 1995, we catch up with Haruka and Yasuo, wanting to give her a copy of his now completed book, including her case, but still cannot explain why he feels compelled to collect these stories. Years later, he's still searching for the house, asking for her help, but Haruka is whisked away by her assistant, offering that she'll contact him. Pulling out some old photos of her boyfriend, she finds the original tape from her apartment with the footsteps, and tries to get some sleep, which proves difficult when the dang light keeps blinking and all the footsteps everywhere. Remembering back to first playing it, Haruka is now at the house with Tetsuya, then seeing the woman there, causing her to freak out, waking up in a cold sweat. We understand the curse still hasn't relented in the years since his death. This sends her back to his 
psychic mother in hope of more answers, wanting to find the house, worried if she doesn't, someone else will suffer because of it. And they perform a ritual to attempt to contact her son. First up, gotta wash your hands, of course, don't wanna get the ghost goo all over you. And they sit down lighting a candle, closing their eyes. She begins to chant while clutching the tape, asking for her son to come out. Then hearing footsteps behind them, mom knows it's him, saying that he used to come often. As the light is suddenly sucked out of the room, they ask where his home is, the book of maps on the table starting to flip through pages on its own, then stopping at one. A ghostly hand appears and points. Mom turns back, seeing her son there. He yells out not to go. The candle blowing out and the light in the room returns to normal. The map now spotting a burned spot left from his finger, indicating the house's location. We then meet others who will soon be infected by evil. The neighbors of the cursed house, Kiichi and his pregnant wife, Chie. She's been having an affair with another man, and that is the true father of her child. Seen meeting with the man at a restaurant, seemingly very excited. Her husband spies on them, catching them together, and already knows something is up. Later back home, he asks where she was, her fibbing that she was out to dinner with a friend. And unlike with her baby daddy, she actually appears annoyed here when he wants to talk baby names with her husband, saying she's tired and walking off. While well, things have only gotten worse with Kiyomi and Yodai, him becoming violent enough that he's seriously injured their son. Him seen amongst the gathered crowd outside their place, where he promptly bolts the scene while she joins the boy in the ambulance. Question about it later, she admits that it was her husband responsible, and then he suddenly grew mad at their son, using the phone to attack him, but doesn't know where he went afterwards. Not the last time we'll see something with a phone. The doctor says that he can't even recognize her, and that there's a possibility he will never regain consciousness. Her heartbroken that he might be like this forever. She comes out of the room and bizarrely starts giggling and playing with her hair. Ariasu comes in running to comfort her, then hearing those telltale footprints behind them. The boy walks out, showing us that he is somehow connected to or under the use of the house as well, even though he isn't actually deceased. Keep that in mind. Kiyomi breaks down that she thought she broke the curse, but it is now happening to her son, crying that she needs to redo her life. Well, too late for that. Sorry, lady. Elsewhere, Haruka goes to a reading of Yasuo's new book, where he's discussing the cursed house and his years-long search for it, which is provided with a surprising new lead out of nowhere. A woman informing him that someone has reached out that knows the house's location, which it turns out is the serial killer briefly seen in episode one. A concerned Haruka rises and warns him not to go, but he's not about to give up after all this time, paying a visit to the killer guy, M. He too asks why Yasuo is interested in these stories, but he still can't say, revealing that at the very least, everyone else in his family is dead. His mother dying after giving birth, then his dad and older sister eventually all died. M would look into old cases of strange things around the city, reading through newspapers at the library, and after a lot of research, kept seeing the same house appearing over the years, which of course he ventured into, perhaps explaining his killer nature. He doesn't remember the address, but remembers an old story of a woman who was trapped there and made pregnant. She was found dead, but the baby had disappeared, this actually being the original incident that created the curse, which we learn about later in more detail. Returning to our cheating couple, they again meet up, and she says she wants to discuss names, but he's cold, saying they need to figure out their significant others first. He offers to help, but she says it's her thing to figure out. Hmm, what does figuring out mean exactly? Having a nice, just frank discussion as adults? Probably not, probably something terrible. Kichi comes home, finding dinner ready for him, and she brings him some wine, pleased as it must be a special occasion. Well, in a way, but not a good thing for him. She comes clean about the baby's true father, and goes even further that she has never been happy a single day of their entire marriage, but couldn't keep her feelings bottled up any longer. Kichi is strangely calm about the whole thing, but there must be a storm brewing inside. He gulps down a glass of wine, and quickly pours another, offering it to her. But she refuses due to the baby and all, and he retorts, it's fine, we can all three die here together. But something is wrong, she's obviously poisoned him. Him starting to vomit uncontrollably. Rushing to the toilet, she grabs a knife, offering to help him with his pain by stabbing him in the back. That's really not very helpful, but uh, thanks, I guess. Hobbling out to the living room, she tries to keep stabbing at him, and once disarming her, he asks if she's all right after all this, geez. She calls out to Nobu, longing to save her, which sets him off way over the edge, grabbing her by the hair and slitting her throat. He declares he has to save the baby, grabbing the knife and doing a little home C-section. Impressively, the baby is alive, bringing the baby wrapped in a blanket next door to the cursed house. He rings the doorbell, getting no answer. As usual, nobody answers the door, and understanding why, as Nobu's wife is seen slumped over dead inside, implying that she was killed by her husband, as we might expect. He takes a seat on the stairs, noticing the baby has stopped crying, and upon further inspection, realizes it's dead. He proceeds to dig a hole to bury it, encountering
encountering a woman outside who apparently lets him in the house, later seen gratefully sucking down some noodles. He says once he returns home, he'll give himself up to the police and politely bows. Walking through the halls, Nobu is found dead, hanging from the rafters, and wonderfully seeing that he shed himself. A brown sludge collecting on the stairs. Yum, yum. Making it back home the next morning, he hears a phone call, and bizarrely, after following the line, finds it nestled inside of his dead wife's womb. Oh, this whole plot entirely is AF. Yasuo continues his investigation into the house. Ariasu is there and drops her papers, including drawings by Toshiki of a woman with dark hair covering her face. Digging into old articles, another woman asks if he heard about the incident this morning, that involving Kiichi, which was at the exact same house. We know that. They rush over there, finding it bustling with police and reporters. He breaks through the crowd and seeing the upstairs window, knows it's the house that he's been searching for and is taken over by a memory of him as a young boy along with his sister, indicating that Yasuo is much more connected to the location than he ever could have realized at this point. He must have lived there. He meets with Haruka, showing the pictures to her the boy drew, and Yasuo realized that he lived at that house until he was five years old. And again, now everyone in his family is dead, all thanks to that curse. He wonders why he was spared, and believing dangerous houses don't cause horrific incidents, they tend to stay out of sight, believing that even this most recent incident will soon be forgotten, and a new family will someday live there, starting the cycle all over again. Ariasu suggests that they track down Kiyomi to understand why all these dark events are circling around her life. Now in prison, Kiichi is interviewed about why he buried the child at that house, him saying the spirits told him to and that it belonged to the house he felt, and is disturbed when hearing a phone ringing in the room, but it's not really ringing, just an effect of the curse that is now attached to him. Even in his cell, the phone begins to ring again, screaming out from the bars to make it stop, as the spirit of his wife appears, who points over to something really weird, like the weirdest part of the whole show. Their fetus is busy helping himself to some food, and it turns to him, crawling up his legs and cooing. Putting its little hand into his mouth, it crawls inside, and that is one heck of a weird way to go. Seriously, what in the world, dude? Yodai is at an apartment, and weirdly, his son is there too, busy drawing more pictures of the woman, which he calls Mommy. Hearing a knock at the door, he knows someone is after him, the boy encouraging him to run away, which he does. Thanks, ghost boy. As the curse starts to expand into further directions, Detective Kosaka meets with Yasuo. He shows him the house and explains the incidents that have occurred there over the years, including eight years after the first incident, mentioning his sister going missing, which he had completely forgot about as he was only five years old at the time. Kosaka chuckles, asking if he's trying to say the house is cursed. He's not sure about that, but does request to see inside, thinking he might be able to remember something if he returned there. So they head to the cursed abode. Kosaka saying some of the officers that have come here have been suffering from strange dreams ever since. Even he says he at points finds himself realizing he has forgotten to breathe, thinking this must be the reason that he feels odd. Yasuo hears a glass shattering. Back when he was a kid seen clutching a baby, perhaps, the same wrapped in blanket package we've seen now multiple times, and runs upstairs, now in the past of back when he lived here, appearing to be in his father's office. Kosaka follows along after, catching a glimpse of Yoshi and Mao passing by behind them, knowing for sure that they are now a part of the house's many spirits trapped here. Looking at a photo of his parents, his mother's face is glared out by the sun. Then hearing sounds from the closet, he sees Kiyomi from back when she was there, brought back to the present by Kosaka touching his shoulder. The closet now just full of crap. Poor Kiyomi has only further spiraled since we last saw her, now living in a sleazy apartment by herself and working as a prostitute, and has paid a surprise visit by her wayward former husband. She tells him to leave, but he refuses, and learn he's not really doing well either, revealing that he just got his kidney removed for some cash. He brings up Tushiki and how he sometimes appears to him, her telling him that he's not dead. Yodai says that he told him to run and actually saved his life. She says Toshiki actually wasn't their child, but was given to her, miming how he was handed over in that house. He gets annoyed, still just wants some sweet drugs. Why are you telling me about ghost kids and stuff? She orders him to the bathroom, again hearing Toshiki telling him to run, and appears repeating the same phrase. He smiles and tassels the boy's hair, who promptly disappears. The others are busy combing the area to find her, Haruka bringing up the tape and the voice on it, considering that they can understand what it is saying that this all might be solved. While Kosaka goes to a real estate office, asking about the house and the old original case there from 1952. He knew all about it. The landlord lived overseas 
keys and left their son in charge of the house. And he was the one that kidnapped and confined a woman and made her pregnant. He thinks that she must have had a miscarriage, but based on her body markings, Kosaka corrects that she did give birth and that the son must have been killed before by the woman. Then there was the incident eight years later in 1960 with the Asuo's family. Kosaka asks if he has ever brought up the house's shady past, but he uses the excuse that people don't care about it and only care about its unbeatable price, which, you know, comes with some pretty serious strings attached. And I mean, you'll be dead within a week of living there, so maybe not worth it. He mentions that a window was broken, thinking that someone must have forced their way in. And this is why it was considered a kidnapping in regard to Yasuo's sister. The real estate agent has been in the house too, leaving Kosaka wondering why he was spared. Well, there's an aspect to the curse that leaves people alive that assists in bringing more people into the house, which he has been doing for decades at this point. So it is in the curse's benefit to actually keep him alive. You can still screw with him ghost-wise in the meantime, right? Meanwhile, the others get a lead on Kiyomi's location, finding the apartment empty and her husband drowned and overdosed in the tub, then flashing back to what went down. Kiyomi mixes together a special cocktail for him and doses him up, and she pushes him back into the little bathtub and drowns him, which is pretty easy, all things considering. I mean, how do you wash anything in that thing? Jay's little ways that's tiny. In the other room, he's already returned as a spirit standing behind her and staring intently. She falls to her knees and starts sobbing, wandering back to the cursed house. She grabs a stick, hitting the window, seeing little Yasuo in there reacting to the impact, and she smashes right through it. Another thing to remember going forward is that time isn't linear at the house, so the incident of her now smashing the window and Yasuo's experience there many years ago is technically connected and occurring simultaneously, despite being divided by decades in the world outside of the house. That makes sense? Not, not quite? Oh well, too bad. Clearly, the trauma of what she suffered there and afterwards is too much for her to bear, sobbing and placing the pictures on the ground and groaning. Her former friends enter apologizing for ruining her life. She longs to return to her simple high school days. You can, they say, asking her to come along with them, and that's the end of the troubled Kiyomi. The police later show up and notice the hatch in the ceiling, which can only be opened from the inside. So they grab a flashlight and climb up. They understand someone must have removed the stairs and must have put all this stuff up here, which has to have been where the landlord's son kept his captured victim. Yasuo gets frightened and reverts back to the past, seeing his sister and himself there. She pulls out a box to crawl into the attic and sees something, her thinking that it's their mom. Yasuo feeling otherwise and winds up falling back down the hole. Well, that's where his sister got taken. He yells up to her and the woman bends down with a blanket, croaking to the boy to bury together. The boy takes the bundle downstairs and indeed inside is a baby, its mouth getting all weirdly distorted and huge. Hearing the crashing on the window behind him, a black shaped silhouette of a woman is seen actually smashing the window, which it turns out was actually Kiyomi. She runs in and grabs the baby and leaves. Yasuo standing there mortified. He now finds his younger self unmoving on the ground, followed by more strange sounds. His dad comes out trying to tend to the boy, and this trip down memory lane causes him to freaking lose it, and now remembers the seemingly impossible time-bending situation that he lived through. Jumping forward one last time to 1997, where just as suspected, a new family is moving into the cursed home, and the wife Tomoko is pregnant as hell. She notices a stain on the wall, which is confusing to her husband Yu, positive that it wasn't there before, showing how it doesn't matter if you repaint or try to move on, the curse will always be there at its core. The doorbell rings, and it's Yasuo, saying that he used to live there and tries to explain to them about the many gruesome incidents from the house. They are at least somewhat aware of its sordid history, but decided they simply don't care to believe it. Sure, that'll work, fine. They politely ask him to leave, and he relents, leaving a card behind in case they need anything, which angers you, who crumbles it up, now yelling for him to leave. Already he's starting to get angry, watch out. And we know for sure the curse is still active, spotting the woman in white up in her typical window lookout. The spirits waste no time in making their presence known. Tomoko trying to sleep flashes to being the woman in white. As you remember, it's always about replaying that initial incident that created the curse, which forces her awake. Hearing a cat yelling, the TV turns itself on to Haruka's first TV appearance, talking about the footsteps. Yu is still asleep until a shadow passes by, startling him awake, then changing to Kiichi's perspective, finding the others in the kitchen and walking away. Meaning that thanks to more time shenanigans, it must have actually been Tomoko that let him in and gave him the noodles earlier. Yu follows after, seeing Nobu hanging there, along with his wife, both screaming their dang heads off. They then reach out to Yasuo for help, who brings along Haruka and Tatsuya's mother, who finds it strange that when entering the house doesn't immediately reject her due to her psychic leanings. They ask to see his wife, but Yu says she's resting. Mom says she shouldn't be left alone, telling Haruka to stay with her while the others get busy with their dangerous ritual to contact the house's spirit. Ascending into the attic space, they begin, and almost immediately hear footsteps, which Mom identifies as 
not being a child, calling out to the darkness, asking who is there, and to whisper in her ear. Downstairs, Haruka and Kamoko chat about how it was her husband that wanted the place so badly, startled by a man in his undies appearing wielding a knife. The spirit of the landlord's son, here to carve her up all over again, which both can see, looming over Kamoko's body and smiling, picking up the knife and flashing to the past, seeing the woman in white fighting for her life, and is able to stab him in the neck, blood shooting out and he falls away. The woman in bed starting to giggle and rises, leaving the room. Luckily, they were able to save Tomoko and her child, getting them loaded into an ambulance, but Yu stays behind, blankly saying he'll follow after the others leave. He starts walking outside as Yasuo sees his father in the past simultaneously doing the same thing. The glass starts rattling. His dad screams out and vanishes in a poof of smoke, now back to Yu filling that role, and he screams too, erupting into a smoldering, smoking pile of goo. Well, gotta say, I didn't expect that, to be honest. Turning into like twin pigs or some shit around here. This leading me to believe that the house was not allowing them to leave. And since they didn't turn violent, making them explode is the only option. Yasuo turns back to the house, mom still in the attic, hearing Barry together in the same croaky voice. She tries asking more about what she wants and if she's buried here too. And the attic door opens, an arm starting to crawl up, belonging to Yasuo's sister and their supposed mother standing nearby. The girl yells out, but this time Yasuo isn't there, looking over and it's instead a pretty wrecked looking lady. Now seeing our woman in white in her true decaying form after being left alone so long in the attic. The sight causing mom to scream and well, gotcha, cursed. You cursed, and you did. We then pick up some time afterwards, where Yasuo and Kosaka reunite after some time apart, saying that he's read his latest book, but there's one part not clear to him. He mentions Kiichi finding the phone in his wife's womb, something only the culprit would know, so how did he? Yasuo says that he's not specifically a non-fiction writer, just a paranormal one, thinking this might be a reason that he was allowed to live. Just as with the realtor, it's thanks to his stories that others will be brought to the house. The detective says to leave it at that, but wonders why he thinks the culprit did it. He thinks it's a talisman of sort, closing up the womb to prevent anything else coming out. Kosaka is shaken, thanking him for his help, but declines an autograph, thinking it might curse him as well, and apologizes to Yasuo's wife, who we barely ever saw in the whole show. He asks if they can have children, and it seems they can't, and according to Yasuo, it's perhaps for the best for some family lineages to stop. After leaving, his wife asks, oh, if he got it right again, him nodding along, which he finds crazy. So no one actually knew about the whole crazy womb phone thing, but somehow Yasuo did and included this detail in the book. To him, he doesn't know where the idea came from, but it appears the curse is in fact operating through him and his words, allowing him to accurately predict and know what happened without having first-hand knowledge himself. Miss Ariasu comes to visit Toshiki, who is definitely still alive and in a vegetative state, as the doctor suggested might happen a few years back. But obviously, he still remains connected to the house, and indeed seems to be a product of it given to Kiyomi by the woman's spirit. She faintly hears him speaking to run away. When getting up to him says it much more clearly this time, maybe he's about to wake up from the coma, we don't know, and back at the house it's empty once more. Except for Haruka, they're busy digging in the earth. Tetsuya's mother's spirit appears, who starts laughing insanely that turns to crying. She then pulls out the original footsteps tape, burying it in the ground, hoping that this will put a stop to the curse once and for all, but not so much, suddenly hearing a baby crying from her purse. When unzipping it, there's nothing out of the ordinary inside. Then the landlord's son appears and lunges at her, covering her mouth, showing us the curse definitely ain't over, and poor Haruka ended up being its latest victim after her whole insane journey there. While this does conclude many of the stories introduced over the course of the season, there is still a lot that could carry over into season two. Perhaps Toshiki will wake up, and they could do some interesting stuff with that as he is from the house, and Yasuo seems to have given up on trying to intervene at the house, but perhaps learning about Haruka's fate would change his mind, and get him pulled back into trying to stop the curse. Generally throughout the movies, no matter what people attempt, it never really stops the curse, but it also feels like the buried together idea wasn't entirely figured out. While we know the woman buried her child in the garden and wanted others to do the same, perhaps there's something more to the idea that could in fact end the curse once and for all. But you know, probably not, and a bunch more people will just wind up getting killed instead. And with that, we have reached the conclusion of this in-depth look at Juan Origins Season 1. I really enjoyed it over overall, and definitely would be interested in seeing where they would go in a potential season two. And they could continue to add a lot more new and interesting 
directions to take the show. Again, there was a ton of stuff here that I was like, whoa, that did not see that coming, that fetus eating the food and everything. It was refreshing to finally see something good come out of the G1 franchise after so much time, and shows that despite what I initially thought, there is still some life left in the franchise. So go check it out on Netflix and get a nice spook for you if you haven't already. Also, don't forget before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Juon Origins and its ending? What would you hope to see in a possible season two? Which entry is your favorite of the franchise? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.